Welcome to our worship this Sunday morning, or whatever time you're watching here. It is Pentecost Sunday, and on Pentecost Sunday, we remember and celebrate the presence of the Holy Spirit coming to his uh, people um, in that uh, upper room. Now, we, we think of the upper room. If you look at Acts chapter 2, it just says in one place. And so we're not sure exactly where that was. But the presence of the Holy Spirit coming in power and moving the early disciples, and especially Peter in chapter 2, to preach a sermon like none other. When you look at the sermon, it doesn't look like anything extraordinary, actually. But the Holy Spirit was involved, and the Holy Spirit moved on the hearts of the people that were hearing um, in their own languages as the disciples were speaking in other tongues, we're told, uh, in, in chapter 2. And we celebrate the beginning, in a sense, the coming out of the church. And we uh, celebrate that in our own culture. On this Sunday, many churches are coming back, meeting face to face. And uh, we are grateful for the uh, opportunity to get back together um, after a couple of months or more of not being able to see one another face to face. Uh, there are many that are gathering together and we are excited about that ourselves as a church. Um, as we look at the reality of the presence of the Holy Spirit, it is um, something that we tend to think of as kind of popping out of the blue that on Pentecost, the, uh, the uh, presence of the Holy Spirit coming in the, the sound of the mighty wind and then the, the tongues of fire coming down, that it had no basis. But when we think about the connection to the Old Testament celebrations and feasts, we see that this was uniquely tied to the celebration of the first fruits. And when you look at the Old Testament um, practices and the festivals, oftentimes you see uh, New Testament applications to these Old Testament activities. And Pentecost is one of them. Though the word Pentecost you don't see until the New Testament, you understand its connection. Where we celebrated the first fruits of the harvest, in Pentecost we celebrate the first fruits of the early church. We, we understand the, the uh, beginnings of of the New Testament church, and we celebrate that as the Holy Spirit comes in power and people just uh, begin coming to Christ in an amazing way. That first day alone, 3,000 were told as Peter was preaching. And so we are grateful for the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And uh, this day, uh, if you'll see the banner up in the corner there, Come Holy Spirit, um, is a, a time where we recognize the role of the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit in our lives. And one of the things that the Holy Spirit does is nudges us, teaches us. Jesus said that when the Holy Spirit comes, he will lead you into all truth. And one thing about truth is it can be very uncomfortable. The truth about our character is sin. We aren't born with a clean slate, just fine, give us enough time and enough information and everything will be fine. We will just by nature make the right decision. No, that is not biblical truth. The bottom line is that we are desperately wicked. Our hearts are desperately wicked. You don't have to look around our nation today uh, very far to see the reality of that. We live in a nation where the heart is fallen and desperately wicked. And you can find that wickedness, you can find that nasty heart uh, in government places, you can see it in the average person, you can see it in neighborhoods across the country, you can see it in religious leaders. Sadly, you can't run from the truth that the heart is desperately wicked. We all need to come to Jesus. We all need to repent and we all need the Holy Spirit to convict us and to empower us to come to Christ. Without the Holy Spirit, we are lost and without hope. And we're going to talk about that a little bit in our message today. And so as we go um, into our time of worship, we want to begin by confessing that reality. The reality that we are by na nature sinful and unclean. And we desperately need the cleansing of God by Christ's work on Calvary. The cleansing that comes to our hearts, his righteousness applied to us. And so let's pray now. Dear Heavenly Father, we do come to you and we recognize that we are not a perfect people. We are sinful. We are sin sick to our core. And we need you to prompt us. We need you to show us 
those areas that we need to confess both the deeds that we do and the things that we leave undone. And so, Lord, we come to you now and we confess our sins to you. We come in brokenness to the foot of the cross, listening to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Dear Heavenly Father, your word has promised that when we confess our sins, you are faithful and just. You forgive us our sins and you cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, we are so grateful that you not only convict us of sin, but when we confess our sins, you empower us with your grace to rise above the fallenness of our hearts, to live with a new spirit, a new heart. And we are so grateful for that. We thank you, Lord. In your name, amen. We want to invite you, if you haven't uh, printed off the bulletin, to follow along. It's attached to the, uh, on the website or on your email. And so ask that you would follow along in the bulletin. The words to the songs are there if you want to sing along. And the first song we're going to share with you this morning and lead you in our time of worship is Spirit of God, Descend Upon My Heart. I'm sure that song was a blessing to you. Uh, we enjoyed singing it. And thank you very much again, Diane, for her willingness to come out on Fridays and record that. And uh, also now begin coming in on Sundays as well. Uh, what a blessing she has been through this process. We uh, get to share the scriptures with you now. And the first passage that we have for this Pentecost Sunday is from Joel, a very familiar passage. Uh, Joel chapter 2, and we're going to begin at verse 28. Joel 2, 28 and following. It will come about after this that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind. 
Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, and your young men will see visions. Even on the male and female servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will display wonders in the sky and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And it will come about that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be delivered. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there will be those who escape, as the Lord has said, even among the survivors whom the Lord calls. Here ends our Old Testament lesson from the book of Joel. The New Testament epistle comes from the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2, and we're going to be reading from verse 17 through the end of the chapter. Ephesians 2, beginning at 17. And he came and preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. Here ends our epistle lesson from the book of Ephesians. Our gospel lesson is taken from the book of John. Uh, this is a section of scripture where Jesus is teaching his disciples as he's on the way from the upper room where they celebrated uh, Passover, the Last Supper, and uh, moving to the Garden of Gethsemane where he would have his final time of prayer before being arrested. And he took some time in that gap as they're traveling to teach. And this is part of that section as he's teaching his disciples one last time. John chapter 15 beginning at verse 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up. And they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, so that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be made full." Here ends our gospel lesson from the book of John. Let's join together as we confess our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed, uh, as you'll find in the bulletin in front of you. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell, the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. We're going to continue our time of worship with another song, another familiar hymn, uh, Breathe on Me, Breath of God. Love 
Welcome back. I hope that song was a blessing for you and very simple song. I hope that you were singing along with it uh, as, uh, as it played. Let's pray as we begin our sermon for the day. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of gathering together. We ask that your word would jump off the page of the scriptures into our hearts, that the power of your word by your Holy Spirit would penetra penetrate um, the busyness of our lives, the distractions that so often creep in, and that during this time our focus would be entirely on you, that your Spirit would guide our gaze from the pages uh, of, our, of our Bibles uh, upward to you, that we might indeed see you clearly. We thank you, Lord, for guiding us now in your name. Amen. As I mentioned earlier, today is uh, Pentecost Sunday, a day that we celebrate every year, uh, 50 days after, that's what Penta, uh, 550, um, 50 days after Jesus' ascension, or the, the Easter, and that whole situation there. So Pentecost would have followed right after Jesus' ascension if you read the beginning of Acts chapter 1, and then moved on to the end of chapter 1 into chapter 2. You see the events of Pentecost happening, especially in chapter 2. And so as we celebrate this day, I do want to start by reading one little section of our catechism uh, that you will find. It's uh, Luther's definition, uh, the meaning to the third article of the Apostles' Creed. The, th the three articles referring to Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Third article focusing on the Holy Spirit. The meaning of the third article will act as our springboard this morning. I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. In the same way, he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. In this Christian church, he daily and richly forgives all my sins and the sins of all believers. And on the last day, he will raise me and all the dead and give eternal life to me and all believers in Christ. This is most certainly true. As I was thinking about the role of the Holy Spirit in the body of Christ, thinking about the amazing ministry that he has, Jesus himself said that until he goes, until he leaves, the Holy Spirit can't come. They have unique callings, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, unique purposes. And the Holy Spirit's job is to guide us into all truth, call us from the darkness of our sinful lives, uh, drawing us to Jesus, the atoning work of Christ, and then guiding us through the word to walk in relationship and the word that we often use there is sanctification so the spirit's job is to draw us to that point of redemption justification and then to continue to empower us to walk in that process of sanctification to be made holy uh, by the work of christ so the holy spirit is not one to draw attention to himself the holy spirit is one who points to jesus and the uh, completed work of christ but he has a unique work of transformation and, in a sense, taking the blinders off our eyes and helping us see clearly uh, the, the call of Christ, the work of Christ, um, and our, our fulfillment in the Father. I was reminded of a situation involving one of our boys. We were at a mall and we were uh, walking <clears throat> around and, and they wanted to go one way, I wanted to go another. So we decided we were going to meet. And so uh, I'm looking at my, the group that was there, my family, and, and said, okay, we'll meet over there. And I pointed across the atrium, said, over there, we'll meet under the bathroom sign. There was a restroom sign. And so one particular son, uh, I'm pointing, and he goes, what sign? I said, that sign over there. 
Where? Where? Over? I said, over there. Restroom sign. It was at that point I looked at Vicki and she looked at me and we realized we have to get this kid to the eye doctor. Big sign, restroom, and he couldn't see it. We found out that he was nearsighted. He had a hard time seeing what was ways away from him. You know, I could have waved my arm all I wanted. I could have gotten angry and stopped my foot. I could have walked across the atrium and stood under and said, you know, right here, and it wouldn't have helped him uh, see that any easier. The condition that he was dealing with was not something he could have willed to get better. We had to take him to an eye doctor, and we had to, he had to get uh, glasses in that, in that process. Now, nearsightedness is not the only problem people have. Sometimes people are faced with the challenges of farsightedness, and, and they can see a long ways away, but that's what these are for. The idea that I need help looking at something that's really close. Over the years, my 2020 vision, I can still see you know, very clearly out there. I don't need glasses. But if I'm reading, this suddenly is fuzzy. It wasn't always that way. Some people have that problem, not just as they age, but just as a general condition of their eyes. They can see out there, but they can't see close. So they need glasses to help with that. So uh, neither side can will themselves to get better. There are certain exercises you might be able to do to help a little bit, but you can't just change it because you want to. A while back, I came upon a, uh, a podcast. Uh, World Magazine did a podcast, and Andrea C.O. Peterson uh, called uh, her, her blog, or her, I'm sorry, podcast, Circular Reasoning. And this is a little excerpt of what she said. All reasoning is circular. At the foundational level, everyone has a final reference point that he relates all stray facts to. One always returns to his starting point, unless God breaks into the circle with grace to open his eyes. Jesus tells a story in Luke 16 where Abraham says, Between us and you is a great chasm that has been fixed. This is not only a chasm of space and time, but of foundational beliefs. God says to those who would come, taste and see, not see and taste. I found this uh, uh, yesterday. I was online and I was uh, going through some Facebook posts. And uh, one person who I know uh, quite well had shared a story and someone had responded with quite an antagonistic um, response, a feeling in their, their answer, in their reply. And so this friend tried to answer some of their concerns, and the person came back with more accusations. And my, my friend is trying to calmly interact with this person, and then finally in the, the third one, you see the bias come out. This source always does this. This source is always this way. This source is, and you understood. Nothing you could share with this person was going to change what they had already determined in their head. That any, uh, any story, any article, uh, any video, whatever, that came from this particular source had to be no good. And it really didn't matter whether you were trying to interact in a congenial way, civil way or not. Their mind was made up. My mom used to say, uh, my mind's made up. Don't, uh, don't confuse me with the facts. And, and oftentimes we're that way. And Andrea in her post uh, or in her uh, uh, podcast was trying to explain that. For a person to think that they are absolutely objective is a self-deception. We all have blinders. And it's hard to get away from those blinders. Um, we see in our own culture right now how things are inflamed in certain areas. And uh, you're not looking at people, one side or another, oftentimes, sadly, that are looking from it from an objective perspective. There are certain bias that are built in, and they're reacting out of those bias in many cases. And it's very sad because the enemy loves it. The enemy loves it when we act and react out of our bias without stopping long enough to hear the other side, to really think about things. 
A, hard, a far-sighted person has a hard time understanding a near-sighted person. A near-sighted person has a hard time understanding the challenges of being far-sighted. But we are that way. Our epistle for today points out two similar conditions. Only they aren't physiological eye issues. They're spiritual vision problems, issues of the heart. But to better understand the context, we're going to have to go back to the very uh, beginning of this section of Paul's letter. So we're not going to start at verse 17, which is where we read earlier. We're going to jump in at, at verse 11, actually, because that's kind of where Paul begins this thought. So Ephesians 2.11, and we're going to start there and then continue. Therefore, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, so you see the two groups, the two bias already, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So we see Paul begin with a little bit of diagnostic, uh, diagnostic work. Uh, he's writing to Ephesians, Ephesians who were primarily uh, Gentiles, unbelievers, especially by the Jews, would point to the Gentiles, would point to the uh, um, uh, Ephesians at that point as the other side of the tracks, to use our vernacular. Uh, we have those situations in our own culture where uh, one group will look over at another group and look down their nose, and that group will look down their nose at another group. Uh, I remember uh, spending several years in the Chicago area ministering at a church, and I was talking to one person about visiting some people in another neighborhood, and they said, oh, you have to go by the, uh, this particular neighborhood before you get to that one. Yeah, well, that didn't make any difference to me. But they, in their mind, had said, well, you don't want to go to that area because you'll have to cross this neighborhood to get there. And I'm thinking, oh, please, you know. There was another time where I had to go downtown Chicago, and this was a western suburb I was living in, and I went down to the place I had to go to, and yeah, there were some interesting neighborhoods that I was driving through, but I just went down there and did what I needed to do and drove back. And I was sharing with a friend the errand I had run that day, and their face went white, just pale. And I went, what? They said, you had to go through that neighborhood and that neighborhood and that. I said, yeah, I just drove down, did what I needed to do. They said, you're lucky to get home. And I thought, I wasn't afraid. Until you said something, I wasn't afraid. But there are those kinds of ideas that we have of one another, of neighborhoods, those on the other side of the tracks. Paul was identifying the Ephesians as being that kind of person, at least to the Jews. They were Gentiles, unbelievers, part of the uncircumcision, and they had nothing to claim of their own. Not only were they social outcasts uh, by the Jews, but they really were apart from the grace of God. As Gentiles, as unbelievers and the uncircumcised, they had nothing spiritually they could claim for themselves as well. That was fact. That wasn't just perspective, as some would say, as far as you know, the opinion about that person or whatever. That would have been the social part. But Paul was acknowledging that spiritually, they also had nothing to claim of their own. As Gentiles, they were outside the umbrella of God. They were unbelievers. <clears throat> to illustrate this point uh, further, I came across a story uh, that I thought was really kind of telling. There was a street preacher who was out talking, and he was sharing about Christ and trying to get people's attention and draw them um, with the gospel to a relationship with Jesus. And he was talking about the reality of sin and grace, forgiveness, redemption, all of that. And finally, one guy comes out of the crowd and he says, you know what? You talk a lot about the burden of sin. I feel no burden of sin. By the way, how much does sin weigh? Does it weigh 10 pounds? Does it weigh 80 pounds? I feel no burden of sin. So tell me, how much does sin weigh? Well, the preacher paused for a moment and looked back at the man and said, now if I took a 400 pound weight and put it on the chest of a dead man, he's laying on the ground and I put four, how much weight does he feel? And the young man goes, he doesn't feel any weight at all. He's dead. And there was silence for a moment. 
The preacher responded, likewise, the man who feels no weight from their sin is dead spiritually. The young man's comments only proved what the old preacher was saying. As a Gentile, both physically and spiritually, this young man, and Paul was sharing the same truth with the Ephesian believers, would have been apart from God. These people were apart from God. And his promises, without hope, alone, dead to the matters of Christ. We live in a culture, by and large, where people who don't know Christ don't understand how lost they are. They know that something's not right. There is this void in their conscience that longs for more. And we, we hear people talk about there is no purpose in life. Their pockets may be full. They may have a big house and fancy cars. They may have everything materially that they're told they need to be happy. But inside they know something is missing. Why else do we see the astronomical suicide rates that we see? Even now, especially in this time uh, that we're looking at in our culture. Suicide rates are going through the roof. Uh, I read one article that said that in the last month they had more suicides, and I think this was in California, but it might, don't quote me there. Um, in one area, they had more suicides in the last month than they normally have in a year. Now, I think that says a lot about the gap and the chasm in the human heart when things don't go our way, when things are closed off to us, when materially we are without what we're used to having to fill the void. Then we look around and there's nothing else to live for. And people are just giving up. And it's sad. <clears throat> Let's go on to the next verse. Verse 13, But now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off, and I love this, but and formerly, Really important words in here. But now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. One of my favorite words in Scripture is that three-letter word, but. Because it always talks about a, uh, a, a transfer, a difference, a variation from what was to what is. The implication when you see the word but is that whatever was before is not that way now. Something has brought about a change. <clears throat> These Gentile readers had been in a completely hopeless situation. Physically speaking, there was nothing they could do to bridge the gap between themselves and God. Ourselves, or uh, the same would apply to ourselves, that without Christ, there is nothing we can do to bridge that gap. They would forever be Gentiles, religious outcasts. If they didn't get any help, they were lost. Um, when our son was trying to see that sign, there was nothing he could do to will himself to see that sign. Without Christ, we are lost in our sin. There's nothing we can do to get up enough faith to be good enough. As the old book uh, uh, said, uh, how good is good enough? If you think you can make it on your own merits, just how good is good enough? Spiritually speaking, they were as far away from God as possible and without any means of redemption. This is before Christ. But, as the verse says, but now in Christ Jesus, it goes on. All of that had changed in a moment in Christ Jesus. But now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off, the verse said, the chasm was bridged, the spiritual relationship restored. The blood of Christ brought redemption and renewal, bringing the Gentiles into the family, both spiritually and socially. In fact, the term used by the Jews when speaking of incorporating a Gentile was to bring them near. We live in a culture of divisions. We live in a culture of separation. We live in a culture where this neighborhood doesn't blend with that neighborhood, where this race doesn't blend with that race, where there's animosity between these people groups and those people groups. The biblical answer to that is Christ. The biblical answer to that is restoration. And in redemption, in Christ, the people groups are brought near. That's the idea, is that you bring an enemy close. Not in the way that you hear the old phrase, keep your, keep your enemies close and your friends closer, or friends closer and enemies, whatever. Um, not that way from a vantage point of self-preservation, but from the sincere desire to become united. 
the sincere desire to have a relationship that was once hostile brought near and and now the enemy become friends and so when a gentile was brought into the body when a foreigner was brought into the body there was an understanding that there, there was reconciliation and boy does our culture need reconciliation right now that there was a reconciliation that brought hostility to an end and brought the person who was far away close <clears throat> Verse 14, for he himself is our peace. Who's the himself? Jesus. He himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments con contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by it having put to death the enmity. How many times does he say this over and over again? The idea that Jesus' sacrifice brought an end to the enmity, the hostility, the, the vitriol between two groups. That in Christ, peace, real peace, could be brought into a strained relationship. And he came and preached peace to you who are far away and peace to those who are near. For through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. Imagine peace in a nation where hostility, anger, and war had been a way of life for centuries. Now, in hearing that phrase, you might be thinking of America. I'm actually referring to Israel. At the time when Paul was writing this, he was writing to a people who understood very well the hostility between people groups, who understood the battles with neighboring countries, who understood the antagonism between this group and that group. Does that have any application to where we live? Absolutely. Yeah, it does. <clears throat> it shouldn't be too difficult to imagine, considering our own times, what hostility looks like. In fact, conflict continues between Israel and every possible combination of nations around them to this day. Israel stands against almost every surrounding nation in the Middle East. It seems as though there will never be hope for that region of the world. No hope for restoration or renewal, neither physically, socially, nor spiritually. And we could say the same. There are some people in America saying the same thing. There can never be peace between people groups. There can never be racial rec reconciliation. There can never be an end to the hostility. And that's absolutely not true. Looking at it materially, looking at it from a vantage point of human efforts, absolutely there is no hope. There's no way that human beings can bring about lasting peace from our own limited resources. <clears throat> Only God can do that. Only Jesus' work on Calvary, if all of us come to the cross, can do that. Black, white, um, Asian, whatever, when we come to the foot of the cross and we look across at one another, we don't see the colors. What we see is people united under the cross coming together. Uh, there really is, I mean, we talk about races, but there really is only one race, and that's the human race. We have different pigmentation, sure. But we all have the same needs, the same desires, the same flaws, the same issues that we deal with, challenges. At the foot of the cross, the ground is level. Suddenly, through the blood of an innocent sacrifice being Christ, peace has come. Not may come at some time. When Paul writes us to the Ephesians, he refers to Jesus' work as past tense. All this stuff has been done through Christ. It's a matter of coming to him and allowing the work of the Holy Spirit by the redemption of Christ work in our lives. It's not about something still to come. It's about something that has already come. Peace has come. In a moment, all the promises that once applied to Israel alone became available to anyone who would come to the foot of the cross of Jesus, including us, including America. By the Spirit of God, the far-sighted were brought near and healed. 
and the nearsighted were brought from afar and given a broader perspective and understanding. In that miraculous moment, the Holy Spirit took enemies and made them more than friends. They are now brothers. They're part of the same family. In that miraculous moment, the Holy Spirit did something that is desperately needed in our nation today. It's, a, it's not something that is yet to come, maybe someday, but it was done 2,000 years ago on a cross on a hill in Calvary. And the Holy Spirit desires to take that reality and apply it to even our lives this is something that we desperately need in our own country, as I said, and specifically in cities like Minneapolis, Atlanta. You've probably seen the headlines, Washington, D.C., L.A., Detroit. Um, the reconciliation and the, the uh, affirmation uh, and the end of hostility uh, is something that we desperately need, but will only happen when we come to Christ and allow the Holy Spirit to do that work. In Romans 12, 5, So we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. 1 Corinthians 12, For even as the body is one and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. Paul explains that this marvelous grace not only formed one body out of the Gentiles and Israelites, it completely removed the enmity, and uh, the meaning of that word enmity, we don't use that word a lot, hostility, anger, antagonism, animosity, between these two warring parties has come to an end. The Spirit of God didn't just stop the war, through the sacrifice of Christ, he completely wiped away the anger and resentment that was so firmly inbred in the hearts of these two extremists. <clears throat> out in this area, you saw it several years ago, when there was a shooting out in the Amish area, and the Amish turned around and forgave the family, worked with the, the family. That is not something that humanly happens. That's not something we can cause ourselves or make ourselves do. That is only something that can come by the work of the Holy Spirit through the atoning and, and forgiving, gracious work of Christ. This is true restoration. Not like the ongoing social, political, and spiritual battles that continue to rage in the cities of America or the pseudo-peace talks that rise and fall in the Middle East. When the Holy Spirit calls and gathers people to the cross of Jesus Christ, all anger and hostility are wiped away and replaced with perfect and lasting peace. When people humble themselves to the enlightening power of the Spirit of God, they are joined with others who have found real peace on the road to sanctification. Peace is restored, hatred is neutralized, and people are empowered to love and understand each other. One of my favorite stories, uh, genre of stories, are the enemies who become friends. And you've probably seen many stories yourself how people grew up in, in neighborhoods where they were hostile towards one another, one black, one white, and they become friends. God, they come to Christ, and God works in them a unique friendship and bond. Or maybe someone who was uh, uh, in a war fighting an enemy, and then down the road they end up befriending someone who they, uh, of the people that they used to fight against. Um, the story is told of Corey Ten Boom, who encountered one of her captors at one time. And he, you know, was absolutely expecting the worst from her, and she turned around and forgave him. Those kinds of stories are only possible when we come to the foot of the cross together. And then Jesus, by his Spirit, doesn't only neutralize, but wipes it away. That's what we're talking about. That's what Paul is referring to in this passage here in Ephesians 2. It is this same peace that is offered to all who come to Christ in humility, regardless of whether they started their journey as near or far-sighted people. Both have been provided access to the very same Heavenly Father through one in the same Holy Spirit. And that leads Paul to write, and this is the section that we focused on earlier, but we had to look at the, what built up to it to really appreciate then this section, beginning at verse 19. So then, so then tells you, you have to go back and look at what it was before. So then, 
You are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit." Regardless of your spiritual heritage, family background, or philosophical perspectives, we all have the same basic condition, the same basic need. We all need forgiveness. We all need restoration. We all need our blind spots taken away. We need the far-sighted need correction, the near-sighted need correction. The blind need restoration. We need our vision restored. As Andrea Peterson pointed out, our circular reasoning needs to be corrected. We need the Spirit of God to give us new sight. We need the Holy Spirit to bring us to Jesus, to open our eyes, and then work in our hearts to forgive, transform, and renovate us. Only then can we become the singular body of Christ that God desires and intends us to be. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, we praise you, that you sent your Holy Spirit. Yes, we are grateful for the atoning work of Christ, and we understand the encompassing um, application of that truth. But we are so grateful that the Holy Spirit takes that truth, works it into our hearts, applies it to our lives, helps us grow, restores us to one another in fellowship, Lord, we thank you for your spirit, that third person of the Trinity, to come to guide us into all truth and to apply that truth into areas that often make us feel just awkward and sad. Lord, we thank you that your spirit has come to give us strength, to bring us to a newness of life by the redemption of Christ. And we are so grateful for this day that we celebrate the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives, bringing unity to a group that was once lost in antagonism. Lord, we also think of those that are struggling, those that are facing health issues. We have a couple of our dear saints that are going into surgery this week, and we pray for them. We have one uh, uh, extended family member uh, who will be delivering a child here soon and we ask that you would minister in that situation that you would guide the doctors uh, that you would be with this um, expectant mother that things would go smoothly Lord we ask that you would be with those um, that are wrestling with the reality of being uh, sh shut at home that, that they're they're struggling with that we ask that you would remove fear from the hearts of your people. The enemy loves to, to uh, nurture fear. But at the same time, Lord, help us to look to the needs, the very real needs and cautions that are there for some of our dear saints. Help us to find that balance. Thank you, Lord, for putting us in a country where we have the liberty to meet, to pray, to worship. May we never take that for granted, and may we not uh, sit idly by as others try to, to rob us of that privilege. Again, show us the balance. For your word also tells us to respect those in authority. We don't want to pit one truth against another. We desperately want to follow both and. Help us to do that. Uh, Lord, we pray for the riots going on. We pray for justice to be brought. Um, uh, for the wrongs, the, the very real wrongs that have been done. But also, Lord, uh, we ask that you would silence the overreach, the over-the-top rioting and, and uh, everything going on in reaction. And, and much of this, I know, Lord, is being pushed by those forces that are trying to undermine. So, Lord, again, silence the enemy, but bring justice where that's necessary as well. Lord, there are so many things that we could pray. We ask that you would uh, move in the areas, concerns of our hearts. You know what they are. And it's in your name that we pray the prayer you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We're going to close with one last song. And uh, for those who may not know, uh, this is the first Sunday that we are gathering together, those that are comfortable. And uh, so to celebrate that, we're going to sing a song, uh, lead you, and I hope you sing along, with a song of real celebration, and that is to God be the glory. Have a blessed Pentecost Sunday. God bless. Bye-bye. Sing.